How's it going? My name is Chris, and in this episode, we are going to be discussing writing tools. How do you become a better writer? How do I become a better writer? And I'm going to tell you how it is by delivering this to you in podcast form. These are the 50 writing tips from this book that I absolutely love, and I've read it twice now and find that I need to just repeat these ideas. I need to speak these ideas to you. I'm going to listen back to this podcast for myself. So in a way, I'm making this for myself and for you to share these ideas because learning to become a better writer is an everyday uh, battle. (laughs) It it hurts a little bit sometimes, but uh, but the the rewards on the other end are, are pretty awesome. This episode's a bit of an experiment and then I'm going to read from the book more than I do in previous episodes. And like I said, I'm doing this because I think that there is so much value in just getting these ideas into the brain and just sitting with them. And like I said, I read the book twice and it's just not enough to just read it. You need to live these words. And that's that's what I think is important. I also think that as much as I read from this book right now, there's no way that I could cover all of the value that is in here. Because in addition to the tools, which I'm gonna read, there are countless examples that I'm not gonna be able to touch upon, as well as assignments. There's like three or four assignments at the end of every one of these tools that things that you can begin to do to apply this to your work right now. So this book is just full of of writing wonder. And uh, like I said, it's gonna be a little bit of an experiment because I'm gonna read a lot more from the book to just kind of to delve into the main points and bring it to you. So let me know if you enjoy that. Let's get it started. Let's get it started. So right now I'm going to bring you the first 10 rules, which are considered the nuts and bolts of writing. It's the chapter called nuts and bolts and it has the first 10 rules. And you know, if this goes well, I might, break out and do the other three chapters in later episodes. Let's see how this feels. This one again is nuts and bolts. These are going to be strategies for making meaning at the word, sentence, and paragraph level. The kind of annoying things that get in your way. Should I use a passive verb, ing, adverbs, adjectives? When do I use that? That stuff to me is very painful. I feel that Roy Peter Clark here makes it quite digestible and easy because he gives you, and and I'll be reading, lots of examples. I find just learning from examples is the best, and he cuts to the chase without giving all the kind of, you know, dicey grammar rules. This is about tools. This is about looking at some good examples, seeing what you like, taking what you like, and becoming a better writer. I'm going to read from the beginning of the book as I always do. So the book starts with an introduction. Americans do not write for many reasons. One big reason is the writer's struggle. Too many writers talk and act as if writing were slow torture, a form of procreation without arousal or romance. All dilation and contraction, grunting and pushing. As New York sports writer Red Smith once observed, writing is easy. All you do is sit down at a typewriter and open a vein. Tool number one. Begin sentences with subjects and verbs. Make meaning early and then let weaker elements branch to the right. I'm going to say that again. Make meaning early in your sentence and paragraph structure and then let the weaker elements as you write branch to the right. This chapter is packed with a bunch of really good examples of this rule, putting the subject and the verb in the beginning and then going weaker to the right. I'm going to read one example that I really like and then I'm going to read a not so good example right after. So here we go. The first one's a good example. This is from John Steinbeck, who I love. And this is Canary Row, which I have not yet read. But here we go. He didn't need a clock. He had been working in the tidal patterns so long he could feel a tide change in his sleep. In the dawn, he awakened. So as I'm reading this, let me pull back. As I'm reading this, notice the words that I'm using. Notice the, the subject and verbs. He, just starting right off, he didn't need a clock. It's a very strong sentence. He didn't need a clock. He had been working in a title pattern so long that he could feel a tide change in his sleep. In the dawn, he awakened, looked out through the windshield, and saw the water was already retreating down the bouldery flat. He drank some hot coffee. So I'm going to stop there, but but again, notice that he didn't need he didn't need a clock. He it's very strong. Now, 
let me juxtapose that with a sentence which is pretty much the opposite. As I read this, see if you could notice the subject and the verb. And I'm going to give you a hint that the subject and the verb are 18 words away from each other. And that's what's going to make it hard to understand. Are ready? A bill that would exclude tax income from the assessed value of new homes from the state education funding formula could mean a loss of revenue for Chesapeake County schools. Wow. That's how I usually <laughs> write on a shitty day, right? It just kind of comes out like word drippings. But that's really hard to understand. So if you were reading it, did you, did you pick up what the subject and the verb are? The subject, a bill, is right up front. And that's that's pretty great. But that that's separate from a really weak verb, could mean. A bill, blah, 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 could mean a loss of revenue for the schools. But we have so many extra words in there. So that's the fatal flaw, and that's what we want to avoid. The tool here, again, is to use the subject and the verb at the beginning of the sentence and then let the weaker elements brush off to the right. Tool number two, order words for emphasis. Place strong words at the beginning and the end. So the idea here is to put your best stuff at the beginning, hide the weaker stuff in the middle, and put the also put some good stuff at the end. Good stuff at the beginning, good stuff at the end, weaker stuff in the middle. I'm going to read some examples here. Amy Fusselman provides an example with the first sentence of her novel, The Pharmacist's Mate. Don't have sex on a boat unless you want to get pregnant. The most intriguing words come near the beginning and the end. Gabriel Garcia Marquez uses this strategy at the opening of 100 Years of Solitude to dazzling effect. So this is the first line from 100 Years of Solitude. Many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Aureliano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. Tool number three, activate your verbs. President John F. Kennedy testified that a favorite book was From Russia with Love, the 1957 James Bond adventure by Ian Fleming. This choice revealed more about JFK than we knew at the time and created a cult of 007 that persists to this day. The power of Fleming's prose flows from active verbs. Remember, that's the tool, tool number three, active verbs. In sentence after sentence, page after page, England's favorite secret agent, or his beautiful companion, or his villainous adversary, perform the action of the verb. Now, I haven't read From Russia With Love, but my friend Alexis did last year, and he told me, Chris, if you pick up this book, you just open the first page, and it's just just like action over action, page after page, you can't put it down. He gave it such a, he just said it moves so quickly and he recommended that I read it because he knows that I like to write and he and he said, this is a great example. So I do find it, it kind of charming that it's also in this book and this first passage is the first passage I've ever read from the book. I'm gonna read it to you now and it is indeed exciting. Listen as I go through this for the active verbs that really give this its 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 power. I'm going to emphasize them a bit so that you can hear them. Ready? Ready for some action? All right, here we go. From Russia with Love. Bond climbed the few stairs and unlocked his door and locked and bolted it behind him. Moonlight filtered through the curtains. He walked across and turned on the pink shaded lights on the dressing table. He stripped off his clothes and went into the bathroom and stood for a few minutes under the shower. He cleaned his teeth and gargled with a sharp mouthwash to get rid of the taste of the day and turned off the bathroom light and went back into the bedroom. Bond gave a shuddering yawn. He let curtains drop back into place. He bent to switch off the lights on the dressing table and suddenly he stiffened and his heart missed a beat. There had been a nervous giggle from the shadows at the back of the room. A girl's voice said, Poor Mr. Bond, you must be tired. Come to bed. So this tool is about using the active verb. And if you've been through, oh man, any kind of elementary or high school, you are probably familiar with passive verbs, which hopefully that makes you shudder a little bit because I know I've had them just red ink crossed out through my papers throughout all the years. And I'm like, what the hell is a passive verb? Why is this ruining my day every single time? Uh, and that is really what this tool is about. It's saying, 
don't use the passive voice. Use the active voice. That is how you're going to get this kind of uh, this, this kind of movement, this kind of fluidity, this kind of power in your writing. George Orwell, author of 1984 and Animal Farm, agrees. He once wrote, never use the passive where you can use the active. The author of Writing Tools, Roy Peter Clark here, gives a few examples and some, some more ideas on how you can develop more of an active voice in your writing. I am by no means an expert on passive voice, but one tip that I would leave you with would be avoid using words like was, have been, or by. Maybe take a look at something that you wrote, whether it be an email or an essay recently, and print it out and circle when you see the words was, have been, or by. Those are some easy indicators that you know you're using passive voice. So something like if you said the letter was mailed by me, that would be passive. And instead, to make it active, you could say, I mail the letter. I'm going to leave it at that and not go much more into it. But obviously, you could pick up this book or read that on the internet, um, a few more examples. But looking at something that you wrote, catch yourself in the act is probably the best way to have a moment of truth with yourself. Do I use too much passive voice? Tool number four, be passive aggressive. So, Tool number four is basically saying, hey, remember back in tool number three, we said to only use the active verb? This one is saying mostly only use active verbs, but sometimes if you're a really crafty author or writer, you might want to occasionally use passive. And this tool is showing you when and how to do that with some good examples. There's a paragraph here by John Steinbeck, and the I'm not going to read it for you, but if I were to read it, you would see that there are... 13 verbs in this passage and 12 actives and one passive. So there's a 12 to one ratio of active to passive. And this is what the author says. Yeah, that's pretty freaking amazing. This guy knows what he's doing. Tool number five, watch those adverbs. At their very best, adverbs spice up a verb or adjective. At their worst, they express a meaning already contained in it. So that's the takeaway that I really got from this chapter here is that a lot of times adverbs are used to kind of just be redundant of something that's already being expressed in the sentence. And let me read a few examples of that right now. So listen along, and this is a little quiz to see if you can find the adverb in the sentence. The blast completely destroyed the church office. The blast completely destroyed the church office. So the adverb there is completely. And consider the effect of deleting the adverb. If I were to just say, the blast destroyed the church office. In this case, it, it sharpens and gives more meaning. And it's really just unnecessary to say completely destroyed, or at least that's the argument that this tool is making. A few more examples, I'll give you one more. The accident totally severed the boy's arm. I feel like that's a pretty easy one. The accident totally severed the boy's arm. So you could just say the accident severed the boy's arm. To understand the difference between a good adverb and a bad adverb, consider these two sentences. So, she smiled happily and she smiled sadly. Think about that. Which one works best? She smiled happily or she smiled sadly? Well, the first seems weak because smiled contains the meaning of happily. She smiled happily. So the second one's a little more interesting because she smiled sadly sadly changes the meaning of what you would have expected and maybe it makes sense in this case tool number six take it easy on the ing's the ings an editor from newsday told me the story of how he tried to help a reporter revise the top of a story as it often happens the editor knew that the lead paragraph could be improved but he didn't know how and as he walked down the hallway story in hand he looked up to see the figure of jimmy breslin who agreed to take a peek at the problem too many ing's, said the legendary columnist. Too many what's? Too many ings. Can a writer use too many words that end with ing? And why should that be a problem, is what this tool is asking. And the answer is not to stop using ing's. You can use them. The point is to not overuse them. Tool number eight, establish a pattern, then give it a twist. I really like this one, and I'm going to read two examples from, from it to explain what a parallel structure is, a parallel construction. So the idea here is that if two or more ideas are parallel, they're easier to grasp in grammatical form. So let me give you an example from Martin Luther King Jr. Ready? 
I'm going to give a little emphasis too so you can hear the parallel construction. So let freedom ring from the prestigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. So if you notice there uh, how King, he builds crescendos from the repetition of words and these grammatical structures. Of course, there's, so let freedom ring, let freedom ring. We hear that over and over again. And then there's these really nice prestigious hilltops, mighty mountains, heightening Alleghenies, snow-capped Rockies, right? And these kind of parallel structure over and over again where there's a noun designating the mountain and the adjective defining this like majesty. So this tool here is, if you see parallel structures, use them whenever you can. There's another great example by the late Neil Postman, who's an author of a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death, which I absolutely love and will for sure be talked about in a future episode of On Books. And in this little paragraph here, Neil Postman argues that the problems of society could not be solved by information alone. So he shapes his arguments around a set of parallel propositions. Ready for this? It's pretty great. If there are people starving in the world, and there are, it is not caused by insufficient information. If crime is rampant in the streets, it is not caused by insufficient information. If children are abused and wives are battered, that has nothing to do with insufficient information. If our schools are not working and the democratic principles are losing their force, that too has nothing to do with insufficient information. If we are plagued by such problems, it is because something else is missing. So as he repeats those if statements and insufficient information, it's like a drumbeat of persuasion coming at you, coming at you. Tool number nine. Let punctuation control pace and space. And finally, tool number 10, cut big, then small. Prune the big limbs, then shake out the dead leaves. When writers fall in love with their words, it is a good feeling that can lead to a bad effect. When we fall in love with all our quotes, characters, anecdotes, metaphors, we cannot bear to kill any of them, but we must. Murder, murder your darlings. One cool thing about this tool here is the author of the book has included the original draft of this chapter as he wrote it the first time through and then has all the strikeouts and edits around it. So it's really cool to see where he like just how much editing there's so much editing and moving things around and I, I tend to take that for granted of course you know you read a book and you know you pick it up and it just it reads so smoothly and wow this person's such a genius but looking at this original draft you you know I get the sense that wow writing is really hard work and I could also learn from examples which again is my favorite part about this book it's not so much on the construction and grammar of the sentences but just giving good examples and how to write better. And that is, uh, that's the book. That's, that's the book. And we read through the hardest part. The nuts and bolts part is mostly about grammar. Whereas the other three chapters of the book focus more on story, character construction, uh, figuring out the mission of what you're writing before you even write a line of it. There's a lot of really good stuff, uh, and how to think about the process of writing. And, I love this book. So I would recommend you pick it up. I may cover more if you guys dug this in a future on books. Uh, let me know how I could help you, you know, get this to you. Like I said, I read it twice and I'm still finding joy in just reading through this aloud. And I'm going to listen to this episode because it's just helpful to, you know, like a practice of, of doing exercise every day. I think that this is a way to exercise my writing and doing it through writing, but also doing it through, you know, oral transmission, that sounds weird, but transmitting my language over the internet waves and listening. And I, you know, and I also made written notes of this book, not just computer notes, because really I'm just trying to ingrain these examples uh, and have better examples in my life of, of writing. So that's, that's what's up. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks again for listening to On Books. This is Chris here. If you enjoy On Books, please subscribe on iTunes. You can do that for free. It will really help out the show. If you can think of someone that enjoys books, maybe you can share it with them. Think of somebody right now who might enjoy this podcast. My whole premise of doing the book podcast is there are so many books that I am not going to read 
in my lifetime that I just won't have the time to, and it pains me, and I love books so much, and there's just so much rich information. So I wanna find people to share it with. I wanna get the ideas out of the books and, and share them and help them grow and, and do whatever that takes. So that's why I'm here, and I'm interested in knowing about what books you wanna hear from in the future. So if you have a book that you'd like to recommend, you can tweet it at me at on books show. I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash on book show. You can email me with some thoughts on the show. I would love to hear from you. I'm Chris at on dash books.com. And that's the website. It's on dash books.com. My name is Chris. This music is my band. This is bird stars. Enjoy it. And you can get any of the past episodes of On Books at the website on books.com, such as Letters to a Young Poet, Writing Movies for Fun and Profit, The First 20 Hours, Sex at Dawn, The Dip by Seth Godin. Tons of stuff up there. Please enjoy it. All right. Another episode of On Books. Keep reading. Talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs>